Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the most interesting lecture of these two days. I believe it. Believe you me. So uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Trotman uh, from Australia. And for whom of you do not know me, I'm Jorge Castillo from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So today, we have been talking about clinical trial updates uh, with novel agents. We heard a lot about ibrutinib and uh, medications like those previously. So we're going to try to do something a little bit different here. Uh, newer uh, PTK inhibitors, um, newer antibodies, uh, newer treatments. So I, I think this is going to be a very exciting time. So let me just... Uh, these are, uh, this is essentially my introduction. This is my name. I'm the clinical director for the Bain Cancer, for the Bain Center for Waldenstrom's. I've been doing that for about five years. Um, this is the Dana-Farber. This is the, the logo of the Bain Center. And I'm going to leave you here with Dr. Trotman so she can introduce the initial part and talk about uh, newer BTK inhibitors. And then we'll, I will take the second half to talk about venetoclax, and uh, a couple of uh, novel clinical trials with uh, new monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I leave you with Dr. Trotman. Thanks, Jorge, and hello, everybody. Um, you'll see I haven't got a photo of my hospital because my hospital's a dump, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we've finally got funding for a new cancer center and it is being, uh, is being built uh, in, a, in a couple of years' time. Uh, now, now, down in, uh, is there anyone here from Australia or Kiwi, fellow Kiwi in the room perhaps? There's a yes I heard, one yes? No? No? Never mind. Um, I'll tell you what, what uh, it's been quite a privilege really to be a haematologist in the last sort of two decades because of the enormous revolution of new therapies that have come. Uh, and it's been uh, particularly uh, important for us uh, at Concord Hospital, and I'm at the University of Sydney, uh, to build our clinical research unit because it's through our clinical trials uh, that we get access to these cutting edge medicines early. Uh, Australia has a public health system um, and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme funds all new medicines. So the, the PBS is great, but the PBS is late. It takes us a lot longer than uh, those of you in North America to get access to these new agents, and it's very difficult to sort of, you know, do any right to try approach. Uh, so it certainly drives us to participate in, in clinical trials. Uh, I just wanted to remind you all, you know, we all want venetoclax now, all right? When do I want it? Now. But we have to remind ourselves of the very robust drug development process. Uh, there's a lot of preclinical research in cell lines and rat models, etc., um, before we do the first in human uh, trials. And uh, those phase one trials are trials where the primary objective is to determine if the drug is safe to give to you and safe to give in increasing doses and to identify what is the, the recommended, the appropriate dose of that medication or combination of medications to be giving you then in phase two clinical trials. And phase two trials are larger cohorts of patients and they're designed to say whether the drug works or not whether it improves on the IgM, improves on the bone marrow plasma cell uh, component, whether it improves your haemoglobin. But it's not until we get the phase three trial, like the Innovate trial that uh, Thanos uh, Demopoulos and, and I participated in, where we compare the new treatment approach with the standard of care treatment approach. And it's usually the results from phase three trials that provide the information to regulatory authorities that enables the drug to be registered, whether it be by the FDA or the uh, EMA or in Australia, the TGA. And so it really was quite, uh, you know, quite an astounding development to have Steve Trion and the team, um, uh, you know, or, or the early, phase two trial of abrutinib 
to be taken into consideration by the FDA and, you know, earmarked for, for rapid development. And I think that was a recognition of the fact that Waldenstrom's is a very rare patient population. But I think we can be, you know, we can be a bit slack sometimes and say, oh, it's rare, it's rare, we can't do controlled trials. But we've actually shown with the Innovate trial, with collaboration internationally, that we can do randomised clinical controlled clinical trials, so that we really have a robust body of data, not just about how well a drug works, but how safely it works and what its side effects are. And I think uh, you're all, or most of you of the generation who remember the thalidomide scare, all right, let's not forget about phase four post-market surveillance um, studies once the, tr once the drug is um, in, in therapy. But there is no doubt that lymphoma research, Waldenstrom's research is moving us away from that blunderbuss <laughs> chemotherapy. We know we, you all hate that word, uh, chemotherapy. And it's moving towards adding in smarter, more targeted therapies. Whether it be the antibody, all right, where the uh, antibody comes and creates sometimes a three-way uh, cell kill reaction on the, the cell that is expressing the antigen, the protein that that antibody is directed against. And we're all very familiar with rituximab, but there is also another type two antibody uh, called obinutuzumab that has been developed by Roche that has been shown uh, to uh, have greater effect on what we call the progression-free survival in another low-grade lymphoma called follicular lymphoma. So it's possible you might start seeing more and more trials of obinutuzumab, the, the sort of next-generation rituximab, uh, being used in combination uh, with other treatments uh, for Waldenstrom's. And Jorge is going to be talking to you about daratumumab, the anti-CD38 antibody uh, that you know, we uh, effectively loaned uh, from the myeloma community because it's been shown to be so effective against the anti-CD38 expressing plasma cells in myeloma. I cannot pronounce this, ulucuplomab. I, I, I don't know who was paid millions of dollars to create that name, uh, but Jorge, you've used this in the trials, so I'm sure you'll, it'll roll off the tongue uh, very nicely when he tells you about this antibody against the CXCR4 uh, protein. And then we've got these small molecule inhibitors, the enzyme inhibitors, of which the first you've heard about is abrutinib. But I'm going to tell you some data about acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, although I have deleted some of my slides because I thought, goodness, all this data might cause a bit of data overload uh, for you. Um, I don't know there has much been done on idololisib in the Waldenstrom setting because we've recognised from other lymphomas that it does cause quite a lot of infection because of the immune suppressive effect. So let's not feel too bad about getting me the hand-me-downs, getting me the Me Too agents from other lymphomas because when they're tested in other lymphomas, they're tested in people like you, and so we learn a lot about the safety of these agents uh, well before they're tested in, in Waldenstrom. So it's not such a bad thing to be the last group uh, to get a, access to some of these new agents. Uh, and there is no doubt, and Jorge is going to give you, uh, you know, a lot of information about venetoclax, uh, the BCL2 uh, inhibitor. I just want to tell you a little bit of a cautionary tale because uh, the immune point, uh, sorry, the immune checkpoint blockers, uh, pembrolizumab, nivolumumab, uh, uh, antibodies that have been used uh, and with great success in Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, I've had young men with refractory disease who've had absolutely phenomenal responses uh, to pembrolizumab. And so having had a fantastic experience with Xanubrutinib, the next generation Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we were very excited to participate in what we call a phase one, remember phase one being safety, a safety study of the combination of Xanubrutinib with another novel PD-1 inhibitor. And we really hoped that the Xanubrutinib would kill off the B cells and the PD-1 inhibitor, as it does in other lymphomas, would harness the T cells 
to help keep the Waldenstroms in check. Now, we had the first two patients with Waldenstroms on this study, and I'm actually very grateful that we had two at pretty much the same time, because we recognised very early both these patients had an overwhelming, a life-threatening autoimmune hemolysis. Now, what is that? Auto meaning self, immune, immunity against self, hemolysis, red cell destruction. Now, I'm a hematologist, and I deal with autoimmune hemolysis all the time, and it's really no big deal to start someone on prednisone and give them a transfusion. But these two patients were hemolyzing their transfused red cells. They were hemolyzing the erythroblasts, the red cell grandparents sitting in the bone marrow. And it was really quite frightening to have these patients with hemoglobin of 43. What's that for you, Jorge, 4.3? Yeah? And thinking, oh my goodness, you know, are my patients going to die from what theoretically on the face of it is a very treatable disease? So very quickly, we stopped the inclusion of Waldenstrom's patients, any other Waldenstrom's patients in that trial. It was very clear to us that we could not carry on in this clinical trial. And I'm telling you this is a cautionary tale because we really do need to get good phase one data before we embark on clinical trials of agents of, you know, with lots and lots of people. There is a absolutely bewildering plethora of B cell enzyme targets that we are trying to focus on with all these antibodies and these enzyme inhibitors. But don't be too worried about trying to learn the pathways. So Xanabrutinib, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure to, uh, and really a privilege to participate in the Xanabrutinib trials. Um, I uh, ha had uh, great experience with Abrutinib in the Innovate trial, and I think you know, it has been a fantastic uh, new therapy for the treatment of Waldenstrom's. But there is no doubt in my mind that Xanubrutinib is a more selective Brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it doesn't have the same off-target side effects in terms of the bruising and bleeding, and certainly doesn't have the diarrhea, the fatigue, the arthralgias. It got a bit difficult when I was consenting patients to participate in the Xanabrutinib trial, because I used to have to tell them about the long list of you know, side effects they could possibly have, and then they'd say, but doctor, what, what have you seen? And I generally couldn't say that I'd seen any side effects that I could attribute to the Xanabrutinib. So we've worked out in, the, in this phase one <coughs> slash phase two trial, it sort of started as a phase one and effectively has become a phase two trial uh, with you know, over 270 patients enrolled in this trial across the spectrum of B-cell uh, low-grade lymphomas. But we had 77 patients with Waldenstrom's and we worked out that the right dose is two capsules twice a day and that causes sort of complete occupancy of all the B-cell receptors in the lymph nodes and in, in the blood uh, for, for, the whole, for the whole day. Uh, and we had Two, you know, two thirds, more than two thirds of them were patients who had relapsed or refractory disease, uh, who had had a, approximately about two prior therapies. So, pre-treated patient population, but not a heavily pre-treated patient population, like the uh, setting of the uh, arm C of the Innovate study. And our median follow-up, and remember this for all these trials, even a brutinib, xanabrutinib, a calabrutinib, our median follow-up is really only two years, or at the most three years. So we can't give you 10-year data about these agents. But the thing we found with the uh, xanabrutinib, and I'm not going to go through this table here, I'm going to go straight to this slide, is you can see that if you look at the column on week 14, and then go through to the column uh, of the patients who'd been the subset of the 46 patients who'd been on Xanabrutinib for a full year, you can see that the purple and the orange parts of the column are getting bigger. And so what we found is that over time, we had almost 80% of people having what we call as a major response rate. 
Uh, and that is a phenomenon that happens not just with xenobrutinib, but a phenomenon that happens with abrutinib as well. But I think what was quite impressive with xenobrutinib was its, its potency and its very rapid uh, rise in um, the depth of the response. And here is the patient's uh, IgM level that came <coughs> down from a median of about 35 grams per litre. Can you see the pointer? No, you can't. So the IgM came down, oh, lordy, 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 okay. I think I'll keep the pointer, it's not my friend, I don't think. Um, so about 35 uh, grams per litre, and look how fast it came down. You know, I used to say to patients on Xanabrutum, I want you to keep a diary, and I want you to tell me what day you start feeling better. And they'd all come back and say, day three or four. You know, it's, it's, it's just um, amazing. Honestly, I feel like I was the biggest drug dealer in Sydney. Because um, people would come and, you know, not really interested in chatting to me, to just want the drugs, all right, every, every month. Because their IgM came down so, so quickly. They felt so, so much better so quickly. And of course, you see these, um, gone the wrong way, you see these uh, curves, whatever, you know, xanabrutinib, calabrutinib, you see the same mirrored response with the, with the haemoglobin coming up. And this is the median haemoglobin of 100 going up to, what is it there, Hawke, I can't see, it's um, 140 something, all right? But that median includes the patients who weren't anemic. And what was quite amazing is when a patient whose haemoglobin is sitting at 75, sorry, 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 7.5, isn't it, 7.5? Um, just, you could see them, we had to see them every week for the first month and see the colour in their faces, you know, as they're waiting in the clinic room as you walk past. Um, it was really quite, quite extraordinary. And so I do find that with the Xanabrutin, pers my personal experience is that it all happens a lot faster. Um, but as you know, you still get there. And the big question is, you know, if uh, the head-to-head -head study comparing Xanabrutin with the Brutin will tell us, you know, uh, you know, who, who gets there faster. Um, and the progression-free survival, about 90% uh, at one year. Just when you look at these progression-free survival curves, a little tip for you all. Try and ignore the stuff out the end, all right? Because it's important that you really only pay attention to where the majority of the patients are still being analysed because the, our confidence intervals, that grey zone starts getting, the 95% confidence interval with, with the data starts getting uh, very broad when you go out to the far end. So you really should sort of look here um, to get a really robust sense of what the progression-free survival um, is. So, you know, it's still very early days uh, for this agent. But we know it's very selective. Um, we didn't seem to see the uh, same rate of atrial fibrillation. Uh, the, uh, certainly don't see the same rate of bruising, and yet we reported bruising. And I'll tell you why we did that, because we'd all had experience with a brutinib. And you walk in, and you've got one little dot on your arm, and I go, grade one bruising. All right, because we're so nervous, we were so, you know, anxiously looking out for it. But we just don't see the same amount of bruising. Um, and it was extremely well tolerated. I think the thing that I never found was fatigue. You know, everyone ha had so much energy on this agent. And it frustrated me because it was a phase one trial and we weren't collecting patient reported outcomes. We didn't, you know, quantify how well everyone's feeling. Um, I've talked about the increased depth of response over time and the 12 month progression free survival of uh, 89%. Um, and the discontinuation due to adverse events occurred in 11% of patients. Now, that's not adverse events because of the drug. It was discontinuation because of, you know, they got a second cancer and they weren't allowed to keep going on the agent, which, you know, one of my patients with prostate cancer was pretty annoyed about because it was his Waldenstrom's that was causing problems, not his prostate cancer. Um, but, you know, none of these were actually felt to be related to the uh, xanabrutinib. And so this phase three study comparing uh, BGB3111, now called Xanabrutinib, with Abrutinib is, is going to be very important. Uh, Acalabrutinib has basically got the same story. It's another second generation inhibitor um, and they did a 106 patient trial here. Um, again, 
the minority of patients who are treatment naive, and most of them having been previously treated, um, not too heavily treated, with uh, only, only a median of two prior therapies. Uh, again, they saw some atrial fibrillation, they saw some bleeding, but again, they had very impressive uh, response rates. And, uh, you know, once again, you've got these impressive uh, progression-free and overall survival curves. What I want to point out here with uh, the acalabrutinib study is um, headache. I don't know whether anyone here has been on acalabrutinib. Um, I haven't used it because we didn't participate in this study, but I understand patients get a, a, a headache, uh, which is dose-related uh, and apparently wears off after the first uh, four weeks and uh, is also helped by caffeine. Uh, so, and uh, grade three hypertension is something that I think we need to um, be mindful of that starts to happen uh, with these patients, whether they're on a brutinib, about a quarter of the patients on a brutinib, but developed new hypertension, uh, and likewise, uh, you know, there's a bit of hypertension that we're seeing in the acalabrutinib study. So if you are on a brutinib, I think it's really important you pay attention uh, to your blood pressure. Uh, and again, while there was uh, a fair bit of bruising in these patients, um, there were only three out of the 106 patients who had a, a serious, uh, what we call a grade three uh, bleeding event, which usually requires uh, hospitalisation. So again, we've got a calibrutinib, you know, the, another second generation uh, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's highly effective uh, with overall response rates up above 90%. Uh, and, you know, with the short follow-up of two years, we don't know what the median uh, duration of response and progression-free and overall survival is. And we, we won't know for many years, I'm sure. Uh, but to have uh, those two-year PFS rates of 90% is, is quite uh, impressive. And most of the adverse events were, were low grade. And uh, almost three quarters of the patients still remain on treatment after two years. So now, this is, I suspect, what you've all been waiting for, is uh, Horgo's uh, experience in the Venetoclax study. Thanks, Horgo. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That was an amazing presentation. Again, exciting uh, information about new medications that at some point will become options to treat patients with Waldenschrams. And um, where are my slides? There we go. All right. So uh, you've been hearing about uh, Venetoclax all along. Uh, Venetoclax is a new uh, medication or type of medication. It's actually a BCL2 inhibitor. BCL2 is a protein that mediates the death of cells, all our cells. So you will not be surprised to know that about 70% of the cancers in humans have an overexpression of BCL2, right? So you're going to be seeing venetoclax on your soup very, short, very shortly. It's going to be tried on every cancer you can imagine. So. It is already a medication that is approved um, for the treatment of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's approved fully by the FDA already, maybe a, a couple, about a year or so, maybe a couple. So based on this information, we were very excited on trying this medication on Waldenstrom's. We do have uh, data uh, from uh, Dr. Trions and others uh, supporting that there's a lot of BCL2 expression in uh, Waldenstrom malignant cells. So it did just make sense to actually try venetoclax on these patients. So the way we designed this study was to expose patients to 200 milligrams of venetoclax once a day for a week, went up to 400 milligrams uh, once a day for a week, and then up to 800 milligrams once a day uh, for two years of therapy. The idea of the study uh, was to see if we were able not only to induce a response, but also able to see if we can actually stop therapy at some point. We wanted to change the current um, you know, mode of therapy with these new agents uh, like ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanubrutinib, in which these treatments are going to continue indefinitely. They are great medications. Uh, we use them. Some of, some of you are on these medications, and you know how beneficial these medications are. But they are expensive. 
um, and more expensive in the United States than in Europe, for example. And um, so thinking about a therapy that is truncated or that you can actually stop is actually an exciting concept. So if you were progressing on therapy or you have any unacceptable toxicity, uh, the medication previously called ABT199, now it's called venetoclax, will be stopped. If you had some type of response or at least stable disease, patients will continue for two years and after two years, the medication will be stopped. So what I'm gonna show you now is the uh, data that we have available until today. Uh, the median follow-up is about a year, so it's relatively early. Um, and, and we'll show you this data very shortly. So here we have uh, the data on our, our 30 patients who uh, had enrolled in this uh, clinical trial. The median age at diagnosis was 66. Um, everybody was previously treated between one up to 10, but more, half of the patients uh, were in about two treatments. Interestingly enough, about half of our patients were previously exposed to BTK inhibitors. Most of them were uh, ibrutinib. One patient was coming out out of uh, acalabrutinib. Everybody was mid-88 mutated, and as we have seen more recently in our clinical trials, there's actually more CXCR mutated patients than expected. If we think that about 30 to 40% of patients with uh, Waldenstrom's have a CXCR4 mutation, most of our clinical trials now, they're having more than half of the patients are actually CXCR4 mutated. So I don't know if they're more eager on getting treated or more eager on participating in clinical trials, but this is something that we're seeing back and forth with multiple different clinical trials recently presented by our group. Um, the median IgM was around 3,500, the hemoglobin was around 10.6, and uh, you know, a proportion of patients had lymphadenopathy in splenomegaly. So the way we measure response in Waldenstrom's, as you all know, is the decrease on the IgM levels. So these columns is one, each col is a, is a called a waterfall graph. So each column is a patient. And uh, the longer the column, that means the lower the IgM got. So we have a patient here with almost 100% decrease on their IgM levels. Over here is a patient with about 15% you know, decrease on their IgM levels. So um, based on this, we can see that almost 90% of the patients had at least a 25% decrease on their IgMs. That's what we call a at least a minor response. And as you can see here, about 75% uh, of patients had an IgM decrease of more than 50%, which is what we call a very good partial response. And about 20% of patients had a decrease at least of 90%, which we call a very good partial response. So these are outstanding results. And this is within just a median follow-up of a year. The study has not been completed yet. So we're expecting these uh, um, columns to get bigger and to get deeper responses as time goes by. Now, um, I, there are different colors here. So the blue ones are the patients who were not previously exposed to BTK inhibitors, and the yellow ones are the patients who were previously exposed to BTK inhibitors. So we can see that there's a preference of deeper responses on patients who were not previously exposed to BTK inhibitors. So that's something new to learn. But despite the fact that you were on a, pre, on a BTK inhibitor in the past, you still have a good chance of responding to venetoclax, despite that fact. So that's also very nice. So when we put all together, 87% of patients had a, at least a minor response, 74% of patients had at least a major response, and about 17% so far has had a very good partial response. We have not seen complete responses yet. Now, this is just how the IgM drops over time. This is uh, up to a year of therapy. Um, obviously, more data will come as time goes by. And then this is a hemoglobin improvement on this side. And the, the graph that really got me more excited than anything else is um, this one here. This is the bone marrow involvement. And as we can see, at the beginning of therapy, the median was around 40%, going anywhere between 5 and 95%. But within six months, that median went down to 5% with a range that went from zero to 20%. And nicely enough, it remained there until cycle number 12 in the majority of patients. So this is the piece of information that really makes me hopeful. Doesn't demonstrate anything, obviously, but makes me hopeful that maybe, yeah, we can stop therapy. Because what we have seen in other, uh, in BTK inhibitors is that we don't have that 
we have a fantastic IgM improvement and hematological response, but the marrow sometimes do not clear. And maybe that's the reason when we stop BTK inhibitors, the, you know, kind of it reactivates itself. But if we are actually really, and uh, I know we need to kind of think that this is a real finding, we need to prove it. Uh, if we are really cleaning up the marrow, then this is but pretty much what chemotherapy does, right? But without chemotherapy. So that's nice. That's nice to see. Um, it is not without side effects. And I think most of the side effects are associated to the dose that we're given. If you are familiar with venetoclax or have read about that, you will see that in the large majority of lymphomas, the maximum dose is 400. And we went up all the way up to 800 based on data from a previous study that we based our studies on, but we are confident um, that probably 400 is good enough. In any case, we designed the study at 800, and that's what we're going to be sticking with until the, the study is completed. And not surprisingly, about 50% of patients had some decrease on their uh, neutrophil counts, but about uh, four to three, three to four patients had uh, uh, low white blood cells to the point that they needed to have an injection of uh, growth factor support to bring their white blood cells up. So that's about 10% of patients. It's very manageable, it's just one single injection and then that normalizes the levels. Now there's some anemia uh, that is actually considered grade three and some respiratory infections, but otherwise all the other side effects are between grade one and grade two, which are uh, side effects that are relatively mild, manageable, that do not need to interrupt or change therapy in those scenarios. So good things are we have not seen an IgM flare, which is nice. We have not seen neuropathy, that's also nice. We have not seen any cardiopathy or, or heart problems so far. But again, follow up is, more, longer follow-up is necessary to know more about this. Uh, in CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, venetoclax is associated with tumor lysis. And that's why we start with a very low dose, and we go up, and we are very careful, and we monitor. So we did have one of those events, but there are two types of tumor lysis. The laboratory tumor lysis, which is just changes in the numbers and that is typically never associated with a bad outcome in patients. And then what we call clinical tumor lysis, in which the kidneys are shutting down and things like that. So we, all, we saw only one case, and this case was a laboratory tumor lysis. The patient never had any um, issues with actual you know, organ damage because of tumor lysis, and um, got managed and got discharged and continues on therapy until today. And no death has been reported so far on this. So, um, this is exciting. This is exciting, uh, number one, because it works. Number two, because we think that we're cleaning the marrow, because maybe we can stop therapy. So the idea behind all this is, can we do better, right? I mean, um, so there are some data in which suggests that we can actually combine BTK inhibitors with BCL2 inhibitors. So, and there are a couple of studies in other conditions that actually showed that ibrutinib and venetoclax can be combined. So we are gonna be moving forward with a study that probably will open sometime next year for patients who have never been treated in, in, in whom we will use a combination of ibrutinib at 420, which is the standard, and venetoclax at a dose of 400 milligrams. And the study will be designed to give therapy for two years and stop both medications. So it's gonna be a, a, a deeper, hopefully sustained. Now, so far, I think the, the selling point for this study is can we really stop therapy? And we don't have an answer for that yet. We have only one patient that has completed, well, two, but one patient has completed that we have actually follow up, and it doesn't, at least in that patient, the IgM didn't seem to come back up, remain there, low, in a very good partial response. Uh, it's about three, four months now. Uh, the other patient, the second patient, just stopped, so we're gonna be seeing results very shortly. Um, so again, very early for us to say that if we can really stop or not. We don't know that. We don't have an answers for that. Good. Um, again, just uh, I want to talk about the monoclonal antibodies now, and uh, there are two studies I want to talk about. But before we get there, we'll, I want to just very briefly review with you how these antibodies work. We have a malignant cell. In this case, is CD20. There's a membrane or uh, a membrane receptor. It could be CD20, CD38, CXCR4. All these are membrane receptors. And then an antibody is directed specifically against that target. So if this target is CD20, this antibody will be rituximab. If the target is CD38, the antibody will be daratumumab, and I'll talk about that in a second. And if the uh, receptor in the membrane is CXCR4, then the antibody is ulocuplumab, which is the new antibody. So I want to talk about that. So the fact the antibody binds to the antigen, that 
events alone can induce cell death. And that's one way in which antibodies kill malignant cells. And the other one is by the number of uh, antibodies that bind to the, to the marker in the membrane, there's activation of the complement. The complement is a very primitive part of our immune system. Um, um, some invertebrates actually have complements, so you can imagine how primitive it is. But it works, it works very well. It's a series of proteins that create a membrane attack complex, or MAC, and what it does is just punches a hole in the membrane of the malignant cells, in this case. So that's one very important, for example, mechanism for retox rituximab. One of the ways rituximab works is actually by inducing this uh, complement activity. But there are two other ways in which these antibodies actually kill malignant cells. The other one is it brings into the area close to the malignant cells T cells or natural killer cells or other cells that we call cytotoxic. Those are not cells that actually eat the malignant cells. Those are cells that go in and basically secrete specific toxins, uh, granzyme B and other um, you know, substances, TIA1 and things like that, and they induce this, the, the death of these malignant cells by uh, their activity. And this is called antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. In addition to that, they also bring into the proximity of the malignancy other cells like macrophages and monocytes that actually phagocytize, they actually eat the malignant cells. So direct killing, complement activation, phagocytosis, cell cytotoxicity, the different ways in which these antibodies work. And we know this from rituximab. Rituximab does this. But these new antibodies also do this. So CXCR4. I'm going to talk about CXCR4 very quickly. Uh, we are very interested on these um, gene uh, mutations. About 40% of patients with Waldenstrom's will have a mutation in this gene. And there are clinical differences so far we understand. And this is mounting data. Um, this is at least three different studies that I have put together in this table from uh, France and Germany in our study as well. So the patients with the mutations on the column on the right versus the patients without the mutations, wild type, which means normal. Then we have that patients with the CXR4 mutations tend to have more bone marrow involvement. They tend to have higher IgM levels. They are more likely to have symptomatic hyperviscosity and they are more likely to have a condition called acquired von Willebrand's disease, which is a clotting problem that these patients can have. On the other hand, patients with CXR4 wild type, meaning without CXR4 mutations, just with mid-88 alone, they tend to have a little bit more lymphadenopathy, and, but much less uh, issues with IgM and things like that. Again, I don't want to tell you that everybody with hyperviscosity has CXR4 mutations, but there's a, an increased risk of these issues in these patients. So clinically speaking, there seems to be a difference between uh, patients with Waldstrom's who have CXCR4 or do not have CXCR4 mutations. Now, in terms of response, CXCR4 mutations, when they are treated with ibrutinib, seem to have lower response rates. And we can see this here. Uh, the, the blue lines, uh, the blue columns, are the patients who have the CXCR4 mutation. And the yellow columns are the patients who do not have the CXCR4 mutation. So we can see that in terms of response, very early on, uh, you know, there's a, there's a difference in these patients without CSF mutations respond faster. These columns are taller. When we talk about major responses, there's even a much more marked difference. The patients without CSF mutations, the yellow ones, those columns tend to be very high, much higher, uh, you know, very early on compared to the patients with CSF mutations. And I think Dr. Trion mentioned this earlier, although the hemoglobin in both groups improves relatively quickly, the IgM really lags behind on patients with CXR mutations, and the responses tend to be more superficial in those patients as well. So not only clinically, CXR mutations are important. If you are treated with ibrutinib, it's important in terms of the depth of the response. And in the study in which patients uh, have been treated who were previously treated, these are patients who uh, have, we have been following for more than five years now, we also see that the duration of the response is affected. These are the patients with mid-88 without CXCR4. 75% of patients continue on the drug five years out. Compared to patients with CXCR4 mutations in whom more than half of the patients had to be stopped uh, or stopped therapy or progressed uh, within four years of therapy. So not only affects clinical, but also the depth and the duration of the response. So can we do better? And this is where this study come around. This is an ongoing study at the Dana-Farber and is exclusive 
for patients with CXR4 mutations. It's the only clinical trial that I'm aware of that is actually genomically driven. In this study, we are adding ulocuplumab, which is the antibody against CXCR4, to ibrutinib. Ibrutinib is actually covered by the insurances. This is not given for free. But ulocuplumab is given for free. And the way this works is we start ibrutinib at 420, which is the standard, right from day one. And we give ulocuplumab intravenously, once a week for the first four weeks, and then every other week for five months, which means that patients do receive uh, 14 infusions in six months. After that, we continue with ibrutinib as we would otherwise. So this is an interesting uh, study as well, um, but you have to be CXR4 mutated to, to participate on this study. We have accrued the first six patients on this study, and we are seeing responses in all of them. Now, that doesn't mean <laughs> much, Yet, it means that we are excited. It means that it works. We want to continue increasing the dose of ulocuplumab and see if that doesn't cause more toxicity. Let's see if that maintains the response or maybe it makes the responses even better. So this is an ongoing study and we want to be increasing the dose of ulocuplumab. If the dose of ulocuplumab gets to be too problematic, then we can also decrease the dose until we find a dose that is actually reasonable, balance between toxicity and benefit, and then we will expand at that level to include about 30 patients in addition. So I think the study will include anywhere between 30 and 42 patients, depending on how many doses and how many people we put in each cohort. So um, interesting and supported by the Leukemia Lymphoma Society and very specific for CXR for mutated patients. The other target that I was just alluding to earlier is CD38. CD38 is a marker of plasma cells in patients with myeloma have 100% of their cells have actually CD38. So daratumumab is already approved by the FDA for myeloma and is used alone and is used in combination and has been around for, uh, for a few years. Very effective. So we thought that it will be potentially effective in Waldenstrom's as well. So, and the reason we've, we felt that is because in this study from the Mayo Clinic, these are cell lines, meaning just cells that were, you know, they're, they're stored and they're created with specific mutations. There's the Bing Center cell line that, we cre that Dr. Trion created and the um, Roswell Park cell line that Dr. Uh, uh, Anand Khan uh, created. And these two cell lines that we believe are representative of Waldenstrom's do show here, as you can see on the, on the right lower corner, an increased expression of CD38. Anything on the right of this line suggests expression of CD38. So there is a, an expression of CD38 in cell lines of Waldenstrom's. Now, that study also included Waldenstrom cells, Waldenstrom patient cells, um, that showed that when they compared the expression of CD38 on the Waldenstrom cells versus normal cells, there was a 5.2 higher rate of CD38 on malignant cells compared to normal cells. So there are reasons for us to believe that uh, this antibody will be effective as CD38 is expressed and also highly expressed in uh, cells of patients uh, with Waldenstrom's disease. So based on that, we designed this study, which is a phase two. We call it phase two because we know the medication is already safe. We already know that it's uh, approved and safe in myeloma. So we are using a very similar approach as what they do in myeloma. We give at a dose of 16 milligrams per kilogram, and it's once weekly times eight, followed by once every other week for 16 weeks, and then once a month for a year. So this is a little bit different than myeloma in the sense that in patients with myeloma, you continue monthly infusions indefinitely, all the way to an acceptable toxicity or progression. But in Waldenstrom's, we feel that if this antibody is as powerful as we think it's going to be based on the previous research that we have seen, then maybe a year and a half of therapy will be enough and then continuous therapy might not be necessary. But again, something that we need to evaluate so we can know what this is all about. So I cannot give you a lot of data on this because uh, this is a study that just started. We have accrued maybe around five or six patients. Um, and um, the, the, the first patient that was in this study, actually there are the patient's IGMs are decreasing uh, and decrease within the first month of therapy. Uh, but that's as much as I can tell you. What we have not seen so far 
is an IgM flare, which we were concerned about that because we see that with rituximab, so we have not seen it yet, but again, it's early. We're monitoring for it. We're monitoring patients on a weekly basis, trying to do this uh, the safest way possible to learn if there's actually a benefit or not. So the, the nice thing about daratumumab is it will be open as well here at the Sloan Kettering in New York. It will be opening um, uh, in Rochester, Minnesota by the Mayo Clinic, and it will be open also in Seattle by the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So it's gonna be a nice multi-center study. And um, uh, obviously, as I always do, I urge <laughs> and ask patients if they feel that they would like to participate in a clinical trial to really consider one of these clinical trials, not only ours, but anybody else's, because we always learn and um, we cannot advance the science if we don't try new things that could potentially work. Thank you very much for your attention. I give you back Dr. Trotman, and she's gonna give us uh, one, one more message right before we open the floor for questions. Thanks, Olga. Yeah, no, wherever you are, I think it's really important that you ask your doctor, can I be screened for participation in a clinical trial? Because not every clinical trial asks the right question for you. Uh, not every clinical trial is, you know, is perfect. Uh, and it's important that, uh, however, everyone gets screened and really consider, they consider whether or not uh, they should be participating in, in a clinical trial. Because that's how we get all these new drugs. Uh, we all recognise that Waldenstrom's uh, is special. Waldenstrom's is rare. But if we all get together, it's a story, we can tell a big story. And Whimsical is the WM study in Cartwheel. And it's a global registry for the patient's voice. And we've now got, 100, uh, we've now got 312 patients participating in Whimsical, so we probably will eventually, the Germans are quite keen to have a German translation and French translations and start you know, uh, providing it in different languages. But basically this was driven, um, initiated by uh, the lead of WM Aussies down, uh, down under in Australia. And we sort of took up the challenge that Andrew gave us to create uh, use the ethically approved, scientifically valid platform of the cancer, uh, sorry, Centre for Analysis of Rare Tumours, the Cartwheel Registry, and add some WM specific questions, you know, questions that are relevant to WM about um, haemoglobins and IgMs and plasma exchange and treatments. Uh, and globally, the great thing about this is it bypasses the clinician, it bypasses the data manager. You are the investigator, you are the data manager putting in your own data. Because you know better than anyone else how tired you feel, all right? And you know better about your peripheral neuropathy and your cramps and your, your headaches, your fatigue. Um, and what we want you to do is to go to this www.cartwheel.org and if you, that's all you write down, just write down that uh, URL because it'll all be there on the website for you. Uh, and you consent, uh, you complete your own data, you can do it in three or four sittings. If you're newly diagnosed and you know what your IgM and your haemoglobin is, it'll take you one sitting in half an hour. If you've had nine lines of prior treatments, it might take you a, a few sittings. Um, but uh, we really want to be able to identify and create a picture of the real world experience of patients with Waldenstrom's, all right? Not just the super fit select patients who live close to Memorial Sloan Kettering or Diana Farber. Okay, uh, and those who participate in clinical trials. We want to get a real world picture of their treatments, their response to treatment and the disparities that exist globally uh, in terms of access to therapies. Uh, we've already got 312 patients from 14 countries and the data that we're getting out looks pretty much the same as the data that clinical registries have, you know, the average haemoglobin, the median haemoglobin, the median IgM, uh, and what we are finding, however, is that we're outing us clinicians because we found 37 different first-line treatments being used globally uh, in the 181 patients who listed their first-line treatment. And that starburst chart there, um, you can see in the 
centre ring, oh lordy, once again. Um, in the centre ring there, the blue is bendamustine rituximab, and then the orange is rituximab monotherapy, and then the grey is dexamethasone rituximab cyclophosphamide. It goes round and round and round until you've got these ever-diminishing circles of, of therapy. And what we found quite interestingly is we already in this relatively small cohort, we could identify that time to first treatment in the US was 48 days compared to 118 days in the rest of the world. Now, is this reliable? No, we don't have a statistically significant p-value. We've got to have a p-value of 0 0.05 uh, before it becomes valuable. So if all of you got online, we might find a statistically significant uh, difference. So I do urge you to go online, and in particular right now, this weekend, we're launching our, our quality of life survey so that we can match quality of life with how you, you know, how you are at diagnosis to how you are during your first treatment, how you are on ibrutinibles, anabrutinibles, whatever. So we do urge you to pay it forward, all right? Clinicians, clinician researchers, data managers, we spend hours on our research. We spend days and months on our research, okay? I don't know whether Jorge you know, sees his children enough. I certainly don't because I'm so committed to uh, our research in Waldenstrom's. But we really want to partner with you in this particular research project. So do encourage you not only to go on, but tap your fellow WMers uh, to come on on board because we're keen for big data. We're keen for a thousand patients uh, and really start showing the picture of the real world experience globally. So now let's go back and maybe Jorge, you could come up and share the, the microphone with me because we're happy to field uh, questions or, or comments from any of you who've been on any of these clinical trials and would like to talk about your experience on a, on a clinical trial. Maybe how you felt when you were asked by your clinician, would you be interested in participating? Well, for, well, for me, it was exactly the opposite. Um, I, I went up to uh, see Dr. Treon and begged him to let me try the, uh, to be in the Abrutinib trial. Mm -hmm because I had heard in my support group a couple, two, three years earlier from Dr. Furman that there was a lot of excitement about, uh, you know, abrutinib before it was even named abrutinib. And everything that Dr. Furman said about um, what they were feeling about the potential just sounded great to me. So I went up there and actually asked if I could be in it. And the, the funny story, I hope uh, Dr. Trion won't mind my saying this, you know, he tried to say to me, don't go, to, go into the trial. Um, you know, I, I'd rather treat, you know, I had uh, some uh, enlarged lymph nodes. Yeah. And he wanted to treat me with something that he knew for sure would shrink those lymph nodes. And I said, gee, I came here to be in the trial. And he said, okay. And um, it turned out to be well, uh, just a wonderful thing. And, um, I can't promise anyone else here that if, if uh, they did it, you know, a future trial, it would work as well, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to go into a trial, and I'd, I'd urge everybody to, to consider it. It was, it was wonderful. The thing we love is the patients who prove us wrong, all right, and, and well done. I think the important thing when you do go on a trial, we, you appreciate that it is entirely voluntary at all times. And just because you've signed consent today doesn't mean to say you have to stay in the trial next week or next month. And it's our responsibility to you if we feel that the trial participation is no longer what is the best treatment for you, is no longer what is appropriate for you because of side effects or lack of response, we will tell you, all right? Because our primary obligation is to you, not to the trial. I had a question about daratumumab. Uh, most of the literature we read about the B-cell maturation process says that lymphocytic cells express CD20 and not CD38, and plasma cells express CD8 but not CD20. But it's sounding as if there's something sort of in between. The question is, is there any information about the, the majority of lymphoplasmacytic cells, what they do express, whether they express a combination of the two or, 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 or more CD20 than not? Yeah, so that's a study that was done a while ago by the Spanish. I mean, the Spanish and their flow cytometry, yep. you know, they're nobody, nobody's better than them on this. So, yeah, about 75% in average um, 
of the clone, uh, lipoplasma CD clone, mm -hmm. do express uh, CD38. Now, if you ask me, um, you know, how confident I am that the ratumumab will take care of all the problem, right. based on how the clone looks like, uh, probably won't, you know? But again, rituximab doesn't either, right? right. So right. my sense is that we need to know what the ratumumab does on its own okay. first. Okay. Once we understand the toxicity, once we understand the potential benefit, mm -hmm. then we can factor in and combine if we think that that's going to be something rational. I think the combinations are probably the best way to go. But if we don't understand the, the, the first variable on its own very well, then it's hard to start you know, combi combining, and, and then we will not know exactly what we're doing. So. Okay. And also, since Dr. Trotman asked us to share experience with the clinical trials, uh, about six years ago, I was on a trial for idelalisib when it was still Cal 101, and that did amazingly well for about a year. I had some hepatotoxicity, but I stopped and came on again. But then after about a year, I developed massive autoimmune enteropathy and pneumonitis, and I lost 40 pounds, and I was in the hospital for two months. So I, I'm not telling that to just scare anybody, but I just wanted to let, let you know that you know, adelalisib does have its problems. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sorry I was on the trial. It was important, but, uh, but that was an experience I did have. Yeah, we, we did a phase two study on idelalisib specifically. I don't think yeah. you were on that. On there that was study. a phase two, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and yeah, I mean, we had to stop it early on. Uh, yeah. The study was supposed to accrue 30 patients, we accrued five, mm -hmm. and three of them had mm -hmm. very bad liver toxicity. Right. Uh, so we decided to close right. the study. And yet it was approved? That sounds a little odd. No, no, it, no it didn't. It was not approved for Waldenstrom's. It was approved for follicular lymphoma. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in follicular lymphoma, they also had the toxicity. Uh, but the efficacy was much, much more I promising see, for see. it. Yeah. So that it finally got approved for it. Yeah. Right, so it's a balancing act. Exactly. Right. Thank so you very much. But, but thank you for your contribution because, you know, we have your data which informs other people. Whereas if you'd gone off and just got idolalisib from your treating physician, we wouldn't know that. We wouldn't be able to add layer on layer of, of treatment. So thanks very much. share a positive comment about clinical trials. My yeah. Could you do that just a little bit close to the sure. microphone? Mm. Try and swallow My it. My first <laughs> treatment was 2-CDA and rituxan, mm. which had almost no effect, mm. and um, I was very symptomatic. I was done with chemotherapy at that point personally, and I searched far and wide for clinical trials. Most of them uh, came from Dana-Farber. So. Mm. Over the next uh, 10 or 11 years, I was in eight clinical trials, and um, some of them worked, some of them didn't, but it kept me going until I could get a brutinib, and I've been on a brutinib for five years, and uh, things are good. So, Fantastic. I think clinical trials are great. Yeah. Dr. Maso. Uh, I was diagnosed 20 years ago and was a treatment failure with all of the traditional treatments. So I've spent the last 20 years sort of trying some of the uh, newer innovative drugs. I was one of the early, early people with Rituxan and that uh, did wonders, but I built up resistance after three trials. Uh, most recently, I think I'm number two that Dr. Castillo mentioned of the second person who recently stopped a week ago Thursday. I finished my two years on Rituxan. I think we have uh, on venetoclax. Uh, on venetoclax. Uh, pardon me, of uh, of venetoclax. We have another venetoclax person here. Being on a clinical trial is a wonderful experience, and I don't want to embarrass Dr. Castillo, but he and his staff are the most attentive, caring people yeah. you ever met. And the, the, I think what I always say about being on a trial is that you never feel like you're part of a study. You really feel as though you have individual attention and that you're not at all a part of a trial. Um, so it's done, venetoclax, I don't want to bore you with all my statistics, but I, my IgM was above 4,000 when I started, it's now 17, 20. My bone marrow, which was 90 some percent involved, is now listed as less than 7%. They can't measure it more accurately than that. Uh, so it's really done a wonderful job with cleaning out the bone marrow. So I'm fine and healthy and wonderful and 
whatever. But the thing that I want to say is if you, you listen to the presentations, none of this would have happened without money for research. Um, and I'd like to encourage everybody, you want to give money directly to the centers, there's nothing wrong with that, but please support IWMF Research Fund. Without that, we wouldn't have had the original genomic studies done, we wouldn't have a lot of these other trials, and uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has done wonderful, wonderful, wonderfully for us but they wouldn't be able to produce the drugs without the research that's being done, and that wouldn't happen without financial support. So please, please do that. I wouldn't be here today were it not for monies that many of you donated to the research fund. Uh, can I just absolutely... Can I just absolutely echo what a superb organisation the IWMF are? Uh, I'm not just a WM doctor, I treat uh, all types of lymphoma and other haematological disorders and I know of no more connected, motivated patient organisation than the IWMF who really are partners with us. You know, three of the investigators in Whimsical, uh, Carl Harrington, Pete Donatus, and Elena Malunas. Um, you know, uh, IWMF, you are driving the agenda. Um, and the amount of, uh, not just the financial support, but the emotional support that the IWMF do. And yes, so much of it is driven uh, from uh, the philanthropy of the uh, North American patient population. But I just really cherish the fact that IWMF are there for you, whether you are in Illinois or India. And um, I think the digital connectivity of you all is just absolutely tremendous. You are so well connected. Mm. Thanks very much. I've been almost uh, four years on RMC of the Innovate clinical trial, mm -hmm. and it's taken me from transfusion dependent and bedridden to this guy who can swim a kilometer every day and carry my grandchildren on my shoulders. So, Definitely a fan. Um, I spoke about the patient point of view at clinical trials in Phoenix a couple of years ago, so that's a, a video you can look up if, if uh, just to get uh, a little more detail. The question I had, uh, Dr. Trotman, you talked about the length of time that it mm. takes from sort of bench to being mm. available to patients, and with the rapid advance of knowledge and, and, and speed of changes, has there been any thought given to ways to streamline the clinical trial process so that we don't end up with those situations where you have the results long after the drug is no longer relevant? Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 there are, and Jorge might like to respond to this as well. Um, we're certainly asking more of our statisticians to sort of design, particularly for rare diseases like Waldenstrom's, to sort of, you know, use some sort of Bayesian adaptive trial design uh, rather than the traditional phase three randomised comparative trials. Uh, it, it's going to get a little bit more trickier too because we've we're really got to be moving away from monotherapy trials and start working about, you know, what clever combinations we can get. And so that will add additional uh, challenges. But, you know, not only is there a clear uh, time incentive to do these trials faster, uh, there's an economic incentive um, because uh, it's, it's very expensive to run trials of, you know, in follicular lymphoma where most of my patients come from, you know, we just participated in the 1400 patient gallium study. Um, so, you know, it, it is hard, it is hard. But at the same time, unless you have big numbers, you don't pick out the rarer uh, toxicities. You know, you might not, without reasonable numbers, have detected the colitis on the idolalacid, the hepatic problems. Um, so we've got to be a little bit careful about crunching our numbers down too much. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, uh, we obviously design is important, right? Uh, we need to have a design that is reliable. We need to have a design that could potentially give us answers faster. And when we think about answers faster, again, the main problem is, yeah, so we can maybe prove efficacy. What do we know about toxicity without long-term data? And that's, that's the challenging part. So if we think about, for example, uh, the classic outcome of interest in cancer always was overall survival. 
So if we think about a median overall survival in patients with Waldenstrom's of 15 to 20 years, that means that to see a difference, we need to wait for 15 to 20 years. That is not reasonable. So we think about progression-free survival, right? That's like the next best thing. And I think the FDA is including that outcome much more as an importance for the approval of drugs. But now most of the data that we are seeing, the median survival, in pa median progression-free survival after bortezomib, bendamastin, ibrutinib, is over five years. So that means that still we need to do studies and wait for about five years to actually see a difference in that outcome. So you know, can we create what we call surrogates? You know, uh, which means, can we use other markers that might predict or will predict for a, pre a progression-free survival before the actual time? So, but again, uh, that will give us the efficacy part, but that will not give us the long-term safety part. And, and that, we need to be very mindful about that. Atrial fibrillation on ibrutinib is a very good example, right? You see it two or three years into therapy. If you do a study one year and then that's it, you stop it, then you never know, right? So it, it, it's, 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 it's not easy. We're, we're working on it, <laughs> but it's not easy. And, and the other problem with clinical trials is the effect of the subsequent clinical trials. We just heard from the gentleman who's been on eight clinical trials, all right? So the Innovate trial, we probably might not show an overall survival advantage from the abrutinib because of crossover, because the patients who didn't get the abrutinib get the abrutinib when they progress. And, you know, the, the purest trialists would say no crossover. But uh, we don't like trials that don't allow crossover. It's, you know, we consider it not ethical for our patients. Mm. So, Pete. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for being a leader in this field. It's helping all of us. Uh, and it being on the Veneta Clax trial, I guess, was a gift from God for me because I'm doing everything I was doing when I was 15. A, a gift from Jansen? <laughs> no, I know. I. <laughs> and that re leads me to two questions. First, it, Venetoclax does look like a paradigm shift for two reasons. It looks like clean bone marrow that we're, a lot of us are getting. That's different than other treatments you prescribe. Is that correct? Well, it's different than the BTK inhibitors, yes. But, uh, you know, the experience with bendamastin, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, or bortezomib, they clear, those clear up the marrow as well. Okay. So it's different than the BTK inhibitors, yes. Are you going to possibly <laughs> present a preliminary findings at ASH in San Diego? Uh, yes, uh, it, will, it will be in, a, in the form of a poster. Okay, last question. You raised the question of cost in Janssen. Is there going to be resistance from the company? Or I, I'm, I'll just say, you won't answer this because I don't know if you know, but it does worry me that if, if this is a once and done for two or three years with venetoclax, what are they gonna charge me if I'm not on a trial? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so there are a couple of ways in which the medication can impact the treatment of patients with, with Waldenstrom's. So let's say the study is completed and the company decides to apply for registration, which means have the FDA approve it. So that would be the best case scenario. But even if the company does not feel that that's in their best interest for X reasons, um, then if the, if the study is beneficial and the study is, is positive based on our own statistical assumptions, then we can always submit this data to be included in the National Cancer, Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, guidelines. And, and most uh, uh, third-party payers, uh, insurance companies, uh, actually follow those guidelines to cover the, the cost of, of, of medications. You so mean off-label off prescription? So it would be an off-label prescription, but it will be uh, guideline supported or guideline endorsed, gotcha. even though if there's no, there's no formal approval. Thank you. Can I also, uh, having used venetoclax a lot in the CLL studies, um, because venetoclax actually came out of Australia, um, uh, the, the wonderful thing I'm seeing about venetoclax is the absence of you know, long-term toxicity or problems that are you know, coming up and the number of people who've been able to successfully stop it and stay off it for, you know, for years uh, with their CLL in remission is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, so, you know, and there's no logical reason to think that that can't be extrapolated to uh, Waldenstrom's. We just have to do the time and see the data. That's right. So uh, we have some cases, so probably the last two questions, and then we'll, we'll get into, into case reviews. Gordon? Yeah. Um, I've been on ibrutinib 
uh, since January of 2019. Sorry, could you just put the microphone closer, yeah, I, thanks. I, I've been on Ibrutinib since January of 2014. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was supposed to be on the phase two extension trial, but it got canceled. Mm -hmm. um, and the team that I work with, Dana Farber, has decided that it's, it's not working now just recently this, this uh, summer. And um, I, I would urge everybody to uh, go on, I, I'm, I'm thinking about going on the uh, daratumumab trial, mm -hmm. and I, I would urge everybody to, 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 to advance the science, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and go to the trials. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. I have a very short and specific question to Dr. Trotman. Uh, those novel BTK inhibitors you were talking about, yes. do they block EGFR? Not as much. That's why I think we're not having um, the, the same side effect profile. Thank you. Mm. They're, they're very, really quite specific, we believe. And that's why I think they're, they're better tolerated. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. We have some case reviews now. Thank you. Okay, this is going to be the fun part of uh, the afternoon. Not like we're not having fun, right? <laughs> so what we're going to do next is um, we are going to present a couple of cases. And uh, we've actually already provided some answers. And this, uh, these are all real cases, all these you know, paradigms that you're going to see are, um, you know, taken from real life. And then I'd be very curious to see the perspective of uh, our doctors, you know, both getting a, a sense of the U.S. perspective, getting a sense of the European perspective, and, of course, the uh, Australian perspective. So I don't know if we have any other faculty members who are here and would like to join us. Okay, great. Well, you know what? The folks that are here are fantastic representatives. So we're going to start off with uh, case number one. And uh, let's see, is this, this one working? Or? I can stay to this mic. Yeah, so this is actually a 42-year-old male. Um, he presented with uh, blurry vision, and uh, he had... Oh, it's not showing, Doug. He knows it. Good. Great. It's showing here, but that doesn't really help you guys, right? <laughs> okay. 42-year-old. He's actually an auto mechanic, and he was having trouble seeing, and he was having nosebleeds. And the trouble seeing was troubling because um, he was responsible for putting together car parts, you know. And uh, I hate to have had my car in the shop at that time. <laughs> but, you know, he had never seen a doctor in his entire life, and he um, was told by his coworkers that maybe you should go see a doctor because he just couldn't see things and he was having nosebleeds. And when he went to the um, emergency room, because that's the only way he was able to be seen, um, he had hemorrhages in his retina. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a second. He had big, big lymph nodes uh, under his arms and he had a big, big spleen, very impressive spleen. Um, his hematocrit was 18% and you see the normal range is usually 35 to 44, so that's really anemic. His platelet count was 50,000. Normal is above 150, so he's really thrombocytopenic. And his white blood count was 1,500, and that was also decreased too. So while they were in the emergency room, you know, usually what happens is uh, they'll run a battery of tests, and the total protein came back sky high, and this then prompted additional workup. And uh, the additional work, which was done over the next few days, showed that he had an IgM, uh, you know, monoclonal protein, and his serum IgM level was 12,400. Okay, I'm just curious. Uh, before I go much further, what is the highest IgM uh, that you guys have seen? 13,700 two weeks ago. 13, 13. It was 67, 67, two weeks ago, yes. Two weeks ago. Uh, and it's, mm, it's difficult to, to measure the IgM level when it's so high. Yes. So we were waiting hours and hours to have the value. But 
that was it. Judy, how about in Australia? I've, What's nev the I've never seen it over 100, but the one time I did see it at 96 was in A Gentleman with Parkinson's, and everyone just assumed that he was very slow because of his Parkinson's. In 96, they use a different scale there. It, that would be about 9,600. 9,600. Yeah, 9,600. There's a fudge factor down under we have to use. No, because the, the, the Canadians always throw us off because their values are also, you yeah, know, so they're, they're yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. So, Castillo. Yeah, the same, in the, in the mid-10,000s, mid I mid had 10, a patient 000. that over 14,000 presented and just very sick. My highest, uh, 18,000. And what was uh, astonishing, and I mean this, astonishing, he had no hyperviscosity symptoms. It was the most bizarre case. Um, 18,000. Now, I think Alessandra made a good point that when your IgMs are high, they become really hard for people to um, measure. You have to keep diluting the sample, putting it in the machine, dilute it again, put it in the machine. So you'll see sometimes uh, where they'll just stop reporting. They'll just say, well, it's above 5,000 or above 6,000. We try to get an accurate number because if we're going to assess response, we need a real number. And then off of that, we tabulate our response. Okay, 12,400, still very high, even though <laughs> we've heard there were higher. Um, so CAT scan showed big, big lymph nodes. Um, the person um, had a bone marrow biopsy with an 80% involvement of their uh, bone marrow. They had the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma consistent with Waldenstrom's, and they had the immunohistochemistry done that showed that these uh, cells were CD20 expressing, meaning the target of rituximab. And he was known at that point to have the MIDD8 mutation. Okay, this shows you what his, um, you know, retinas look like. And I don't know if you can appreciate it. These are all hemorrhages, all these little blots that you see here. And you see the, the uh, vessels here, the retinal vessels are engorged. And here's a big, big, big uh, hemorrhage as well. Um, so when uh, we see a patient like this, um, you know, this is an oncological emergency because if you see bleeding there, there could be bleeding, you know, in the brain. If there's bleeding going on in the eye and the retina, you, you can also lose your vision too. We've had, you know, a couple of cases where people um, had delayed uh, initiation of therapy and uh, they ended up with retinal bleeds. And thankfully, and, and I think all of those cases, we were able to get them evacuated and they got most of their vision back, but what, we don't want to take a chance. We see this, this is an oncological emergency. So this is now the provocative question, and that is, you know, which is the next best step in the care of this patient? And, you know, there is one right answer and there's one awful answer, <laughs> okay? And I think after being here for the last uh, 48 hours, you probably know what the awful answer is, but I am curious to see um, what our panelists say. Now, we can try Rituxan. He's CD20 positive. We can give a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib. We can give some type of alkylator drug like bendamustine or cyclophosphamide. We can try a, a nucleoside analog. That's the fludarabine drug that you heard of. We can try ibrutinib, or we can try plasmapheresis. So, um, Jorge, what, what do you think would be the way you would manage this patient? So, uh, from my perspective, the absolute right answer here is plasmapheresis. That's, absolute right that's answer the absolute plasma. Absolute right answer. Whatever you do afterwards is obviously depends on the preference of many different uh, opinions. But the, the thing that everybody will do here, for sure, will be to plasmapheresis this patient so we can decrease that IgM levels. Some doctors might feel pressed on actually transfusing these patients, and we need to be very careful about that because transfusing patients who are hyperviscose, they can actually make the hyperviscosity worse. So plasma is first, then consider transfusions is needed. The probably not right answer in general terms is actually rituximab as a single agent. Uh, Do you all agree with that, by the way? You all agree so with that? So with the 40% IgM flares on rituximab single agent, that's probably something that I will be a bit more careful about. Uh, now, he being 42, um, and, and again, it's a my style, it might not, be, might not be representative of what other people might do, but I would prefer not to expose this patient to uh, stem cell toxic uh, regimens like fludarabine, for example, or even bendamustine in this setting. So I think protosome inhibitors, uh, bortezomib, uh, or even ibrutinib uh, in this uh, case, uh, patient is 42, so we'll have to be careful about the duration of that study. Uh, of the, the duration of the treatment. So those would be the two options that I would consider. Judy? So 
as you say, this is an oncological emergency and this is the thing that makes me feel really, really anxious until that first plasma exchange is finished. And then after you've done your first plasma exchange, you can breathe a little bit and you can make haste slowly. Because we do, though it's emergency, the patient has developed this over months. It's, you know, and they're young and were able to adapt, uh, gradually adapt until he's sort of decompensated. Uh, so after a few plasma exchanges, I, I would be starting to see what his uh, haemoglobin was and whether I gave him one unit blood or not. Um, looking at giving him an iron infusion so he can uh, make, you know, his own blood because he's, uh, you know, ferritin's probably falsely elevated uh, because of his uh, Waldenstrom's. But that's not getting me away from making a decision about what I would give this man as definitive therapy. Uh, I'd love to see what, uh, I'd be pulling out the ClinTrial Refer app in Australia and seeing what trials are open for Waldenstrom's. Uh, I suspect he's probably CXCR4 mutated uh, with this presentation. And did you say he did have bulky disease as well ah, as the... That's, it's a now, bit you of see, a this is being an yeah. astute clinician. Yes, I did say um, bulky adenopathy. And bulky adenopathy means big adenopathy. Oh, so yeah, yeah. I am uh, so I, I'm I glad have, that she picked up on that. Yeah, <laughs> I've come to this meeting with, uh, not to the patient meeting, but to the clinician meeting, with one concerning clinical practice question that I actually haven't had answered. Um, and that is, is there a patient who's too young for bendamustine? In the sense that for the young patient who's 40, all right, you know, and I, with apologies to those of you who are 72, but they've got more skin in the game in terms of me trying to get them to be 80. You know, I'm trying to think what is my 30 year plan for this, this patient and what are my choices that I make now going to, how they're going to impact uh, the future choices. So it's, it's really tricky because of the bulky disease. I'm, you know, really quite keen to, once I've got the oncological emergency out of the way and the IgM, para, uh, IgM level down, I do want to be initiating rituximab in combination with, with bendamustine because I do want the synergy and I can artificially lower the IgM. So I don't tend to start with bendamustine alone and then add in the uh, rituximab. But I am nervous about the long-term stem cell toxicity for this 42-year-old. But the, the results with dexamethasone, rituximab and cyclophosphamide, I know the PFS is probably only going to be three two, years. three years. Yeah. But by then, and this is where you do look at the trial profile and the trial landscape, um, by then I would like to hope that in Australia we would have a venetoclax combination, xanabrutinib, you know, trial, that would be my dream trial, um, and maybe access to the um, upulo, you know, the anti-CXCR4 antibody uh, Yulo, trial. Yulo. So they're, they're all the things that are running through my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And starting to talk with this 42-year-old um, once he's had his plasma exchange. I don't think this guy's in much shape for detailed conversations until we clear the fog. Right, right. And I, and I want to just, uh, you know, um, highlight that point. None of the other therapies we know are going to work right off the bat, right? So you've got somebody who's sky high and they've got bleeding. That's the first, second, and third, you know, correct answer. Um, we could certainly debate as to how much plasmapheresis we might do. I mean, some centers might offer three or four, you know, before they would even uh, consider starting therapy. Uh, but that's more an art that depends a lot on the center that uh, is managing the patient. I'm so sorry. Can I just also add one more thing? Mm -hmm. There's one drug I think I would not give this guy in a hurry right now, and that is venetoclax, because he's got so much disease. And even with a ramp up, I'd be really nervous. Okay, all right. Those are all good points. And uh, Alessandra, reflecting so on this cage, what do you think? So you are from lucky countries. You have a lot of choices. We don't have so many choices. Of course, we have plasmapheresis. Mm -hmm. uh, so plasmapheresis is, uh, of course, the first thing to do, but it's not treatment. Um, so from these things, we have uh, benamastin and uh, alkylators. Uh, we don't have the possibility to use uh, protosome inhibitors in first line, uh, which gives a fast response, so maybe a good option. Um, Nucleoside analogs not in first line, uh, 
toxic uh, for the stem cell. Um, maybe in a young patient with uh, bulky disease, we would use bendamustine. Uh, as uh, DRC give a good response, but it's a very late response. So maybe we would use bendamustine uh, first. Okay, so, so I hope you picked up on the dilemma here, and that is <laughs> that, is that um, these doctors are very concerned um, by the fact that these are, you know, this is a patient presenting very unusually, lots of disease, big bulky lymph nodes, um, and the dilemma here is using a drug like bendamustine, which, you know, can damage stem cells and put this younger patient maybe at future risk for other problems, but you have an immediate crisis. And what I think you're also concerned is that, you know, if you use a drug like ibrutinib, it may take too long. And so this is really the dilemma. This is a, a real case. We would probably end up sitting and talking about this in uh, clinic rounds uh, for a while. Um, proteasome inhibitors, you know, I, I think I'd probably shy away with, even though the temptation would be not to use a, an alkylator. We just, um, I remember from all our trials, we saw little traction with, um, big, big, you know, lymph nodes. And with ibrutinib, we know that lymph nodes do shrink. Um, we just don't have any bulky experiences that we can rely on. So I would probably be facing with the same dilemma. And in this case, I might have, you know, gone with bendamustine. Um, I do have a question, though. Bendamustine usually is given for six cycles, although more and more in Waldenstrom's, we use four, not six. This guy's got big, bulky nodes. I mean, could we potentially give them less, you know, and maybe decrease the risks here? We know that there's data out there that says we see less, uh, you know, long-term side effects if we do that. And, you know, Alessandra, you're, you're the one who published recently on this experience, yes. so what, what do you think? What we do at the beginning is to start with a lower dosage. We don't give immediately the 90 milligrams, so we give 70 milligrams, and then depends how the patient is going uh, with uh, neutropenia, growth factors, support, and so on. And maybe we keep going with the six cycles at uh, 70 milligrams, but we never start at 90 milligrams. While yesterday we saw a trial with um, patients 88 years old starting with 90 milligrams, which is um, a lot. Yeah, that's a little too, too strong. <laughs> Um, Judy, what do you think about uh, bendamustine, the dosing, and how many cycles you might give to a young person? Look, I, I know that 90 milligrams was pluck, per meter squared was plucked out of a thin air dose, but it's the only dose that we have good long-term data yeah. on. And he's a young person. If I've made the decision that I'm going to try and get uh, good remission uh, uh, and as long a remission as possible, I'm going to give this guy six cycles, 90 milligrams per meter squared, days one and days two, and only dose reduce if he has uh, significant cytotoxicity, which we tend to see in the fourth, fifth, sixth cycles. But we don't see it with 40-year-olds as much as you see it with 70-year-olds. So I, I fully expect this, this chap will actually get through all, all six cycles. Tell me, am I, am I wrong in my expectations, Alessandra, at this age? Yeah. I think the chances of getting them through six cycles is good. Um, you know, you may end up with uh, some suppression of his white blood count or platelet count for a while. Um, you know, I, I think this dilemma of four versus six uh, has been tested out, and uh, a lot of people have tried to answer this based on their retrospective data. Hori, I know you have some data on this. I mean. Uh, one way we can decrease the risk here is maybe use less. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, in the study that we did, uh, we, uh, again, the sample size is small. Uh, so we evaluated a two-by-two -two approach in which patients were getting 90 versus 70 or lower and four versus six cycles. And we didn't see any combination being more beneficial than other combination. But again, uh, so that means that we could potentially use four cycles instead of six. Or we could decrease the patient's dose to about 70 milligrams per meter square instead of 90, and still patients will do well. But again, uh, it is not prospectively tried. Our retrospective data is showed it's a very small sample size. So, uh, uh, you know, and again, if I uh, would be in the patient situation, and I could, because my age is almost the same as that one, um, I, I would still would not feel too comfortable actually getting full dose bendamustine if I were the patient. 
Um, there's another option here that we have not seen, which is ibrutinib and rituximab combined based on the Innovate data. Um, I do have ha I have had a number of patients with bulky lymphadenopathy um, responding very well to ibrutinib single agent. Um, so I don't think the bulkiness of it would be one way for me to say, oh yeah, the patient needs to have a, 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 an alkylator or bendamustine in that specific sense. Now, if I'm concerned about the, how quickly the patient might need to be might need to respond, you know, um, I can always plasma furies this patient if the IgM will be to go up again over over 5,000 or so until ibrutinib kicks in, um, um, in addition to to the to the rituximab therapy. I think the other interesting thing is what this 42-year-old motor mechanic, is, his motor mechanic, wasn't he, is going to want. And I suspect he's going to be keen on six cycles and then nothing, thanks, Doc, um, then continuous therapy. Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. And Eva, would you like to join us? Come up. We were looking, we were looking for more help, so perfect. <laughs> you, you walked right into that one. <laughs> Yes, of course, this, this young gentleman, he was afraid of doctors, I think. He didn't see any doctor. So it she might picked up be, on that too. <laughs> it might be that his disease was not very awful, but he waited too long to seek medical advice. So of course, I would really agree with you all that you do the plasma phoresis, you really do that immediately, you know, and don't let him go back home. You know. I should keep him in the hospital some days at least, and inform him, and also show him that doctors are kind people. Yeah. 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 So, so we, we followed Eva's <laughs> advice, and uh, in fact, everyone's advice here, and we did the plasma phoresis for this patient. And his vision and his energy improved. In fact, his um, eye exam uh, was normal uh, just a week later. So that just shows you how fast things can change if you do the plasma phoresis, that you get this very quick normalization. And now his IgM level after, I think he had four rounds of plasma phoresis, was now under 4,000. That's important because that's kind of the threshold that we use to make a decision around rituximab. And so now it's 3,892. And now we're asked, you know, what you would do at this time. And I know we, we've heard from the other panelists because they, um, they're, they're very forward-thinking people. They already, you know, went beyond the plasma phoresis. Um, what do you think, Eva? What would you do at this point for this patient? Yeah, uh, I, I think I would go also for our banda, even if this is a young patient. And I should not decide on how many courses from the start. That was a bit dependent on how he oh, tolerates does. it, you know. Right. So I would, I would start in this case with a 90 milligram per square, and then I would really follow and up and also evaluate the response. He has a, a tumor load in the abdomen, so I would go for, uh, uh, after like three courses, I would go for a CT for evaluation. Yeah, and I think that's really the right advice because um, you know, you might think about the number of cycles that you might give, but after three cycles, let's say he was in a CR, do you think you would need six cycles? No, then I, 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 I would consider to stop after four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this could be, this is basically doing this on the field, you know, making that decision. But I think conversely, if he had lymph nodes after three or four, you might go the extra two cycle. If, you, if he's responding, you might say, well, you know, let's get the job done here, right? Okay, that really does represent the consensus. I mean, these cases are, you know, have been presented to at many other forums, and this is kind of how people uh, think. The point that Hori raised is a good one, though, because you do see uh, ibrutinib activity um, in patients who have lymph nodes. Maybe in this case, it's the bulky um, disease and also the concern that, he's, that he might be CXCR4 mutated because he has such a high IgM. Well, as it turns out, Hori's concerns uh, may have just been answered here um, because um, you now get the genotype before you write your chemotherapy orders. You just got the genotype results. You know it takes forever to get back, you know, these kind of results. But you now find out the patient does have a CXCR4 mutation. It's actually that really bad type, the nonsense one that, you know, is associated with ibrutinib, um, you know, relative ibrutinib resistance. And... Um, 
meaning that um, it will take a lot longer for a patient to respond. And this is in the frontline setting, so the median time to a deep response is about seven months. So we have to keep that in mind. So does that in any way affect your thinking? Um, you know, maybe um, starting with Eva, does that, the fact that this is now somebody with um, both MIDI-D8 and CXCR4, Arbenda would would still be your choice, or would that make a difference to you? No, uh, that would be my choice, yeah. because uh, Veronique Leblanc show that uh, these patients have also a response yes. to, to the chemo with rituximab. Yes, yes. And uh, anyone do anything different based on this information? Jorge is reaching for the mic. Yeah, so, I mean, um, it just clinically speaking, it doesn't really match our experience. Patients with CXR4 mutations typically do not have extramedullary disease. So the case, per se, is a little, a little atypical. So the fact that this is just, is just a little weird. In any case, uh, if I were to have bulky disease with a nonsense CXR4 mutation, uh, I would definitely go for bendamastic and retoxin of this patient. I think this patient will probably not do as well um, on, on ibrutinib and plus or you know, with or without rituximab, I think um, alkylator makes sense. And I think four cycles, great response, which I, I find it unlikely. You know, unlikely that the patient will get into a CR with four cycles, but more likely six. And then consider, in my mind, maintenance, depending on where the patient is. Okay, we've got uh, four countries and four, four doctors in agreement. How about that? <laughs> But, but you see, the, uh, there's, there's one thing that I do think this really illustrates. First of all is really the complexity of trying to integrate a lot of data points here, you know, for this patient. Um, and, you know, also the, the idea that there could be differences in opinion, you know, based on what we know today. And why, you know, there's all this evolving knowledge. You know, you heard about Veronique LeBlanc's data with CXCR4 mutations. We just heard about that this week. That didn't really exist previously for us to be able to know, you know, uh, how bendamustine is impacted by CXCR4. So this is why what we learned here is already now being applied to these cases. So I think it's wonderful. All right, case number two. This is uh, another young person. So this is a 46-year-old man. He was diagnosed with Waldenstrom's after he presented with uh, fatigue. His hematocrit was uh, decreased to 28.6. Uh, bone marrow biopsy showed 90% involvement. Um, before I go on, actually, what's the youngest case that you have seen with Waldenstrom's? I'm just curious. Uh, I heard 36 from Judy. Yeah, we have 29. You know, 29 patients. from Dr. Castillo. 43? 43 from Dr. Tedeschi. A lady, 35. 35. So you can see, you can see, um, you know, cases of Waldenstrom's even younger. I think our youngest, uh, just predating Hori, was uh, 24. And that person um, did, in fact, have Waldenstrom. So you do see, you know, younger patients. It's very, very rare, though, in the 20s. Very, very rare. Even more rare in the 30s. 40s, we do get our share of cases, although this is an unusual case. And that, you know, may be important to consider, even from a biology point of view, the disease. So 90% involvement, that's a lot of disease. Um, the patient uh, had CAT scans that showed no enlarged lymph nodes, so it's not like the other case. And his IgM was 2,700. So, you know, as is typical, you look at a young patient and you don't want to, you know, notice how much concern we had about using an alkylator drug. So the doctor here used bortezomib-based therapy first, you know, wanting to avoid any alkylator drugs to injure the bone marrow. And unfortunately, after three cycles of uh, bortezomib, dexamethasone, and rituxan, nothing happened. And so then uh, he was treated with two cycles of cyclophosphamide, so now using an alkylator, along with dexamethasone and rituxan, no response again. And then they went to bendamustine, and uh, the patient got two cycles of bendamustine and nothing changed. So this is what we call a primary refractory patient. Three lines of therapy and we've made no difference. And the patient did have a bone marrow biopsy, and this showed, in fact, that he still had 90% involvement. Uh, and as part of the workup, he was determined at this point to be mid ED mutated, and he continued to be uh, symptomatic. Um, would you guys be worried about this kind of patient right off the bat? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I would be worried even after uh, 
CDR. So, <laughs> yeah. yes, after the second line. So, Alessandra, um, we've seen, if I remember correctly, we've seen a number of people respond to bendamustine after cyclophosphamide. I mean, if they didn't respond to, I would wonder how common that is. Um, you, you certainly have a lot of experience uh, in Italy. Oh, in yes, we have seen patients, but this is a mm, triple refractory patient, so uh, it's difficult to see a patient like this. I mean, we see response after having achieved a first response in relapsed patients, but this is a triple refractory patient, so uh, it's very difficult to handle. Anyway, we have in inhibitors now, so right. something has changed. I would, I, would, I would guess that this patient had a P53 mutation or deletion, something is, is chemo-resistant. Okay, so the, so the panel is worried that he might have uh, this uh, P53 mutation, which at that time really wasn't tested. Now we know from this meeting and from the literature that we heard, uh, presented that, um, from studies that we heard presented, that P53, seen in what, about 5% of patients maybe, based on the data that we heard, um, could, you know, represent this kind of patient who's really not responding to multiple different therapies because that creates, you know, in and of itself resistance. So, you know, we're asked at this point, we have this primary refractory patient, what the best choice of therapy would be. And we're still dealing with a 40-ish year old individual, so um, you know our choices at this point, and there could be others, could include using fludarabine. We could do ibrutinib uh, either by itself or with rituximab. We could do everolimus. We heard about that. That's one of those mTOR inhibitors that we talked about earlier. Um, we could use carfilzomib. We haven't tried that drug. That's another type of proteasome inhibitor, so it's like a Velcade-like drug. Um, or we could go to transplant. How about high-dose chemotherapy and autologous transplant? And of course, others always up there because there are always other options, including clinical trials, and that's important. We've been focused more on mainstay of therapy, but always know our first, second, third choice will always be to try to get a clinical, uh, offer a clinical trial option to a patient. So, all right, panel, take a deep breath. Where would you go? <laughs> I, I would go for ibritinib, and is, this is a patient who is really still, uh, and we find the P53 or this mutation, I would go for allotransplantation. I, I would l use the ibritinib as a bridge to allo. So we're hearing ibritinib with the consideration of doing an allo transplant. Everybody know what, what, what an allo transplant is? You take stem cells from a donor and give it to the patient after high dose chemotherapy. Okay. Alessandra? Uh, I would give ibrutinib alone. Uh -huh. He already received uh, rituximab in two lines of treatment, so I don't think rituximab is going to add anything. And uh, of course, uh, allo, if uh, he gets a good response, or maybe the better uh, bridge to transplant we have in this moment is venetoclax, but is not available. So. Um, I brought in and the allo transplant. Okay. Yeah, I th I would go for a brutinib. I'd want to know his p53 status. I'd be lining up an allogeneic donor, and then once I got plateauing of response to a brutinib, whether it was after a year or 18 months. I'd be talking to my providers of venetoclax about trying to actually get some compassionate access to venetoclax as then a bridge to transplant because with the abrutinib I'm not going to get, you know, the depth of response that I would like pre-allogenetic transplant. Um, but it will certainly get them in good shape. Um, but I would, wouldn't like to take them to allogenetic transplant in a world where venetoclax may be available somehow without getting exposure to that. Um, I think the most irresponsible thing to do to this man is to give him fludarabine. Okay, yeah, Dr. Castillo. Because, uh, and there, uh, sorry for the patients, uh, the explanation is because he's you know, multiply primary refractory and he will not respond to it and just get further stem cell toxicity. So everybody hear that? that uh, Dr. Trotman would avoid fludarabine at this point because uh, of the possibility of, of killing the stem cells.
further. And, and you know, also this is a young patient, and we did hear about secondary malignancies. There's infection risk. Dr. Castridis is joining us. Uh, would you come up to the stage, please? <laughs> and we'll get another chair here. We, we're recruiting panelists. We're recruiting panelists here. So as you come in the door, you're getting, uh, you're getting called into clinic here. <laughs> Where else do you get this kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> tour de force? Um, I w I'm going to tell you about how this patient did, but the case is about a 40, this is a 46-year-old person. I, fo I followed the case. Oh, you did? Awesome. Yeah. What do you, th all right, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough, tough one. Um, I would go for a brutally balloon, no transplant at this chemo-resistant patient, and um, we have, to, we, we have to discuss the allogeneic transplant possibility. If there is a donor. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, the patient is a great candidate for ibrutinib. I think a clinical trial will be fantastic for these patients. Uh, you know, just try to see if we can maybe save ibrutinib for the next uh, line of therapy. Um, the allo transplants, um, I think if the patient has a great, fantastic um, donor, maybe. And I, and I want to say maybe because um, we do have a number of patients in my clinic who were allotransplanted and they were not cured. So uh, I, I don't think the cure of the disease is what we are trying to achieve with allogeneic transplantation in this specific scenario. I agree that the patient is chemorefractory and then therefore maybe autologous transplant is not the right choice at this moment. But I'm not completely positive that allo genetic transplantation should be for sure the next, uh, the next step in, in this specific uh, situation, um, because these patients do have, as you already know, their own acute and chronic GVHD problems, infectious complications, and if you are not curing the patient from their wildstroms, then you are doing all the toxicity for no, no, no curative benefit. Now, if you tell me that you're doing it because you think it's going to give them a, some degree of PFS, and then that's a, that's a different story. But then, you know, the price we're paying for that PFS. And, and so, so yeah, I think ibrutinib uh, alone um, is, is, is reasonable. Um, I agree that maybe the patient is refractory to rituximab. There's some data that ibrutinib and rituximab might be synergistic. So, but I, I think ibrutinib alone would make a lot of sense. I'll just uh, make a, a comment. I think that in that, such difficult cases, providing the patients with more options, more PFS, it's crucial, because, you know, after one year, we may have a new fantastic drug. I mean, I remember uh, one patient that we had no option, and suddenly brutinib came, and everything changed. So we don't know what we're going to have after one year or one year and a half. A new trial with a drug that is very active, a new targeted <coughs> therapy. So we have to have options. And uh, this is a comment that uh, also Steve made yesterday, and we, for the treatment recommendations. We have to have the options on the table and see how we can use it. So thank you. Um, that, that, that is exactly how people would think and worry. You know, we're gonna, we have some options here and um, are we gonna use um, allogeneic transplant? Maybe somebody should just comment on what the risk is. Um, risk of dying to allogeneic transplant? Do we have a, a number we can all agree on? I think. 25%? This age is 20, yeah, 20. A, a bit less because he's well, young. He's young. He's young. Yeah. yeah. So maybe 20? But he's been pretty battered by... But he's seen a fair amount of therapy. Yeah. It's probably close to that number. But, you know, so what we're saying here is um, maybe a 25% chance of dying because of the procedure. So you can see that you know, we really are raising the stakes. Uh, uh, before I tell you what happened with this patient, and it's actually a, a, you know, an important, um, you know, it's important for us to discuss that, um, what do you think about option five? Should we at least think about giving him high-dose chemotherapy and transplanting him with his own stem cells? Or do you think, everybody's just saying no here, that's not a good idea? Chemo-resistant patient. Chemo-resistant yeah. patient, right. So what we learned from Dr. Kiriakou in her publication in JCO a few years ago from the European Bone Marrow Registry data is that if you're not responding to you know, your therapies, um, you're not gonna really benefit by high-dose chemotherapy. So it's important the patient is chemosensitive and responding. 
Okay, now, what happened here is that this patient actually was patient number two on the pivotal trial. So he went on and got ibrutinib, um, went into a major response. In fact, he's almost a complete responder. And uh, now he is in his sixth year of being in a major response. Um, so I, I raise that because, I mean, he did extraordinarily well, even though he was refractory to all these therapies. So I learned a lot by looking at this case. Um, but I share your concern because in somebody like this, do we now, you know, think about allogeneic transplant or should we just let him continue to respond in you know, see how he does. We don't know his CXCR4 status. We were never able to genotype him uh, for CXCR4. He was the one patient that we never got a genotype on, so for CXCR4. So I'm gonna presume he's probably wild type, only because, um, you know, his, the type of disease presentation that he had would favor that. But I'm wondering what you think about uh, letting, him, let, letting him continue to do well as opposed to offering him any intervention at this point. I don't know, 25% chance of death is a little concerning. Oh, yeah. I don't even know he'd want to have that conversation with me, but yeah. how do you feel about that? I, I think that, you know, after one year, Ibrutinib, if he had a good response, I would still wonder if he had this P53 mutation. And if he had the mutation, I would suggest still mm -hmm. ALO. But if he had no, I would, like you, go on with the Ibrutinib. So I think he, he has not, an, no. For in CLL, if you have this P53, right. many of the patients will relapse. They will respond, but they will relapse within one or two years or three years. So, so then it is still a young person. Okay. Any uh, questions from the audience on this case? Yes, please. So how realistic is to have a panel of specialists? I mean, I'm, I'm in Spain, there are no specialists who want to control, so no, no, no. At our hospital, yeah, I'm sure in Spain you have, you have some, yeah, that yeah. there probably happens the same thing that happens in my hospital. You do, unbeknownst to a lot of patients, get a panel of specialists who have the case all succinctly put up with all the patient demographics, their social history, their comorbidities, their various prognostic factors, and we debate what we do indeed think is the most appropriate treatment for that patient. Yeah. Um, please. I've never heard anyone say anything about the treatment with the Rituxan and Velcade. Oh, for Any this patient? No, this patient did get that. They did have Velcade. It was up front. It's the drug. Uh, okay, bo I bo came in after this. Yeah. So no, they got they got actually three cycles. No, no, don't don't feel feel bad at all. Um, the patient did get three cycles and actually just kind of didn't didn't at all respond to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, are you guys up for another case? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're ready. <laughs> um, yes, please. One question. So this this is going back to case the first case, and. Uh, the, question, the question I have is, is uh, this person that had this pretty v extremely high IgM, the first, everybody agreed that the first thing that needed to do is decrease that burden by plasmapheresis. By plasmapheresis. <laughs> I was wondering, just in general, on an average person, uh, the standard, it doesn't seem to be standard practice within in the medical world or within the Waldenstrom's world to think about even a person that has, let's say, half of that, say 6,000, uh, to plasmapheresis first and then start therapies, uh, just to lower that burden ev yeah. uh, even I, more. I, I would say that uh, the reason why that patient was being plasma because that, that patient did have the hemorrhages in the retina, so that no, represented... No, I arm. understand that. But I, in the absence of that, if you're asking if the patient was asymptomatic, is there an IgM cutoff that we would offer phoresis? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, it, it would actually... It would actually depend, I think, uh, on what we're going to do next. I mean, if you're going to be offering rituximab, let's say, you might consider plasmapheresing the patient. 
down so that you get some safety you know, and avoid the flare. And other people would say, well, maybe we should just do the chemotherapy or ibrutinib, whatever it is that we would decide on, um, and then add the right toxin at some point later. And I think that's become more and more our practice. With bendamustine, certainly, we might give a cycle or two of bendamustine alone, get the IgM down if the patient's asymptomatic otherwise, and, uh, and then add in right toxin. That would probably be what most of us would do. I don't know if there's any difference in opinion. No, I, 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 I plasma exchange it, uh, quite is, enthusiastically. Um, this, is a, the, this is an asymptomatic in the person. the asymptomatic yep. patient. It's easy, it's straightforward, um, not associated with too, you know, too much toxicity or complication. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly inconvenient. I say it's easy. You know, I'm not the one who's got my arms stuck out for four hours. Um, easy but, for you to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we need to understand that the decrease in the IgM with plasma pheresis doesn't really do anything to the actual burden of disease, either in the lymph nodes or the marrow. It just decreases the level of the IgM, so we could be more flexible for us to actually intervene. But the disease is untouched by all means. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it is not something that we routinely do. I, I think we would, we would actually... Um we would actually have a very hard time getting our blood bank doctors to do the phoresis if they, if, you know, we even still have trouble, even when they're symptomatic sometimes, they push back because there are risks um, with plasma phoresis. They're not big, but we have seen people had some serious bleeding complications. So, you know, more and more it, it's getting harder, if anything, to phoresis people without a good cause. Um, let's go on. Uh, yes, the comment. yes, please. Because there are some patients also where their EGM is cryoactive. Mm -hmm. And these patients, if they go for plasmapheresis, ah. there could be problems if yeah. they are not d knowing that. So they will do it in a warm room. So that could sometimes be very important to get the, this cryoglobulin away. And, and then you have really to do it in a proper way. Yeah, yeah. 37 in degree in the room. Yes, yeah, in fact, we put blood warmers on each yeah. side just to keep the blood warm because the cryoglobulins can precipitate in the tube as the machine is running, the blood gets cooler, and if you haven't kept it warm, you can start precipitating, causing problems. We've had that. We actually had one patient with cold agglutinins actually have the agglutinate all the blood as they were going through the machine. Um, any other comments? I didn't mean to cut off. Now, I, you know, I never did tell you what happened in that first case, did I? Are you curious? Yes. So he did get bendamustine. And uh, he got actually four cycles and did exceptionally well um, and got some maintenance rituxin. And in fact, he had about a two and a half year remission. And then his disease came back and he got ibrutinib. Uh, and he is now year five on ibrutinib and doing actually quite well. And that's a case where it's not a, a matter of, you know, ibrutinib will be used at some point, whether it's initially or afterwards. I mean, it's just trying to figure out what the right circumstances are. And that really was the teaching point of that case. I think I was too enthusiastic to move on to the next one. <laughs> so, Steve, can I just make a comment yeah, about your man who's been on a brutal for five years and the other yeah. you know, primary refractory patient who was on a brutal for six years? Mm -hmm. They're the sort of patients who I'm really very keen to, uh -huh. when they do progress, to go to something like venetoclax rather than an allogeneic transplant. Because, like Eva, I'm not so worried that they've got a P53, you know, they've got a really unstable disease if they've demonstrated a good response. I mean, would you comment on that, Jorge? You know, yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's, say, let's say a patient is coming to see me and a uh, patient is chemotherapy refractory, uh, is progressing only brutinib, and he doesn't qualify, let's say, for a clinical trial. I mean, it's, it's a rare case, but let's say that is the case. Then um, that would be probably one of the cases in which I would say, you know what, maybe, you know, considering venetoclax off-label kind of an a uh, in a very kind of an emergency situation for that case uh, alone would be something I would consider if there is really no other choice. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, in preference to a transplant. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. I will, if, if we were, let's say, to have an etoclax commercially available for, for Waldenstrom's, then I would definitely try that before I get into allogeneic transplant. Okay, wonderful. All right, I'm going to give you one, uh, one more case here. Uh, and we've got a 68-year-old male. Um, he was diagnosed with Waldenstrom's after he had a hive-like rash. Whether this was really related or not, I'm not sure in retrospect. 
Um, but this brought him in, and he had some blood work, and his IgM, um, you know, his blood showed that he had an IgM monoclonal spike. His IgM level was 1,250, and he had a normal hematocrit. Um, he did get a bone marrow biopsy at that time that showed that he had 20% involvement, and his mid-88 status was not determined. Um, his uh, CAT scan and his exam was otherwise uh, unremarkable, and he went on, you know, watch and wait. And I think all of us would agree this is a watch and wait at this point. Um, and so six months, uh, you know, within the next six months, he started getting um, numbness and tingling in his feet, and then uh, it evolved into his hands. By this point, his IgM had climbed to 1,900 and uh, his hematocrit stayed the same, and the doctor, the local doctor, decided to do another bone marrow biopsy, this time showing 30% involvement. Whether that's a real climb or not, you know, is debatable because, uh, you know, it's, it's hard when you're trying to estimate these things. Um, but maybe he had a little bit more disease. But as part of the workup, he did have that MAG antibody checked, and this is the one that is associated with Waldenstrom's related IgM neuropathy, and that came back you know, very, very positive. Um, he had also the testing for the amyloid protein, the Congo red, which was negative. Uh, and he had EMGs, the electromyographic uh, testing that showed that he had the demyelinating peripheral neuropathy. So this would really suggest that he has an IgM mediated neuropathy. The IgM is probably binding to the insulation around his peripheral nerves and causing its destruction. And that's why he's getting this, I think, very classical pattern of neuropathy. So he got tried on plasmapheresis um, because of the rapidity and how fast uh, all his um, peripheral neuropathy was progressing. And this helped him temporarily. He got some benefit. And then he got rituximab. And, um, you know, they were going to give an extended course, so four weekly infusions and then four more, you know, three months later. And uh, during the uh, course of getting the rituximab, um, his IgM was noted to abruptly rise and his neuropathy got worse. I mean, in fact, he came screaming at the doctor that, you know, things were getting much worse. And uh, by this point, his IgM was 4,310, and his hematocrit was 42. And I'll just show you what uh, his IgM looked like from baseline to week 12. So this is about the decision time that we're going to make about giving him the second course of rituximab. So what do, you, what do you guys think is going on here? Is his disease rapidly progressing, or what's going on here? His neuropathy certainly is much worse. I would say Ah, we have somebody saying this might be a IgM flare. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, is, it is atypical for Waldenstrom's to progress so rapidly. So I agree and with the history of rituximab exposure. I think this is more likely an IgM flare. Yeah. And just remember, too, he'd been plasmapheres beforehand, so his baseline IgM was artificially lowered, so the flare might look even more pronounced. I am, however, a little bit nervous that it's week 12, and I'd be checking it you know, every two weeks from now on, um, because it should be, to my thinking, really should be starting to drop down. Um, and can one of you explain to me why the peripheral neuropathy is worsening? Is that because of the IgM flare that you get the worsening of the symptoms? Yeah, I mean, and we just need to stay, stay strong? Um, but it is a bit unusual to have it s so late, perhaps. Alyssa? Uh, what we normally do in this situation is to add from the beginning cyclophosphamide uh, with uh, rituximab. We are not allowed in Italy to give rituximab monotherapy. Uh, so what we do is to add the cyclophosphamide. He has also an anti-mag, uh, so it's uh, basically an autoimmunitary disorder. So cyclophosphamide may fit here. Uh, nothing else. <laughs> Okay, all right, so we all agree that there's a flare going on here because it just is atypical to see the disease progressing so fast. And so with this in mind, you know, we're suspecting a flare. Um, and flares uh, sometimes can last weeks. So I think, you know, to Judy's point, you know, um, you know the time course here, we really don't know. It might, it might take weeks to months sometimes we've seen. Uh, so we'd be concerned about that. So we, we have to make a decision at this point because he's now 
in the clinic ready for his next round of Rituxan. And we can either continue, Hori's saying no way, but we can continue with a planned second course of rituximab and just, you know, what was it? What was, one of you said tough it out. Um, the second one could be, you know, continue with rituxin, but add another agent. So that might be one way we can deal with this. We can stop the rituxin and start a whole new, brand new treatment. And we could do plasmapheresis. Notice how I have two choice threes there. <laughs> That's a typo. So you could do plasmapheresis and then reconsider one of the above options. Um, if we want to be really purists, we could do a bone marrow biopsy and uh, make sure that he's not rapidly progressing. We could certainly consider that. And I always put other because it's safer to just always put other because somebody might come up with a really brilliant idea, and this group would. So um, what do you think? Um, maybe Stathius, what do you, how would you uh, go about managing this patient? He's waiting in your yeah, clinic now ready <clears throat> to be infused. In this case, the neuropathy really worsened. Yeah. So I think uh, we have to do something immediately. So I would go for plasmapheresis and then add something, add another agent. I don't know if I would, uh, probably with rituximab, probably I would add uh, chemotherapy to, to rituximab. Do you, do you uh, just to hold you to that, what, what kind of chemotherapy would you add at this point? I would point? go for bendamustine. For bendamustine, okay. Anything different, uh, Eva? Would bendamustine be the right answer, you think, here? Or, I mean, there are other choices, too. I don't know if you, there may be other options we should consider uh, for know, him. If he has only the neuropathy, and I would also go for a plasmapheresis if I thought this was a flare. And then I should go on with, uh, I think, a cyclophosphamide, like the DRC. At cyclophosphamide, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I think I would wait with rituximab. So okay. I would, for the second course, I would put on rituximab, but not the first one, after plasmapheresis. And, and really, this is an art at this point. I mean, there's no guidance, so what we're using here is best clinical decision-making to see how we would manage this. So this is very, very appropriate how we would be thinking and, you know, deliberating. Alessandra? I absolutely agree with cyclophosphamide from the beginning. She <laughs> says, I would, have, I, would have, uh, I would have cut this off at the pass at the beginning by giving cyclophosphamide with the rituxan. And would you have given dexamethasone too, steroid? Or yeah, so she would have done the RCD. She, we, she wouldn't be dealing with any of this if she, you know, if she had just added in cyclophosphamide from the beginning. Although I do want to remind you, though, um, and Stathi, this is your data from Greece that when you use the DRC regimen, I think you saw a flare in about 30% of patients. Yeah, so that you, so you can get a flare. You can get a flare. It's not 50, but it's still not. It's not like the brutinib numbers, you know, where you almost never see a flare. So we could still get a flare. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. I think plasmapheresis makes a lot of sense. And then I will try to add a medication that will not uh, cause additional neuropathy. So I think cyclophosphamide is an option. I think bendamustine is an option. I think actually adding ibrutinib is an option. And um, carfilzomib is another op option that we tend to use in young people, you know, sometimes when we don't want to expose them to chemotherapy and we want a finite duration of treatment. So those are options that I will be thinking about in, in, in my mind. I don't think there's one right answer, actually. Okay, but how about, what would be your answer, though? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> my, yeah, if the patient had an NYD88 mutation without CXR4 mutation, I would really like to get into the deepest response possible. So this is a patient I would consider ibrutinib in addition to rituximab with no issues. Okay, all right. No, that's a, that's a respectable, um, very respectable option. Uh, Judy, how, how about down under? What would we do? Uh, um, very uh, enthusiastic plasmapheresis and then back to DRC. Okay. Four right. or six cycles. Th the back total. to the cyclophosphamide based therapy. Okay. Because I, I would like to have, really would like to have more data on ibrutinib and neuropathy mm. that is needed, more data. Yeah. When we did the pivotal trial, um, in giving uh, ibrutinib, these were all rituxan, um, refractory, uh, IgM, um, you know, demyelinating neuropathy patients. I think we had nine out of the 63 patients, and five benefited, and four remained stable. And I think that probably would, I don't know, we might even do a little better here because these were rituxan refractory patients. Yeah. I'm very keen that we map out what happens with the peripheral neuropathy in patients on BTK inhibitors because I've had a, a few patients on Xanabrutinib whose peripheral neuropathy has definitely stopped and gradually, gradually, ever so gradually uh, got better. Yeah. Improved. Not complete recovery, but 
yeah. improved. Yeah, our experience of clinical trials uh, it is also, we have seen some improvements, uh, some stability. And again, there's a, you know, the, the not unusual patient in whom the disease progresses regardless the best, best response. But in this type of patients, I think inducing the deepest response is the, is the best option to improve the neuropathy. And I think one of the trials that we you know, have talked about is uh, looking really in a, in a very dedicated way at, these, at this patient population with the BTK inhibitors you know, talking about nine patients on the trial, you know, it's, it's still a relatively small number of patients. But when you consider that 20% of patients with Waldenstrom's have peripheral neuropathy as, uh, as a complication, um, it really begs for us to do a dedicated clinical trial. And this, I think, represents one of our high priorities because if you don't treat these patients adequately, you'll continue to deteriorate and, um, you know, then the patient becomes uh, incapacitated over time. Okay, I, I think actually we got through this. Um, just to tell you how this patient did, um, this was a, a case that was just about the time when the trial was going on, but the patient lived far away from, um, from our clinic. Uh, he lived in California, and um, he opted to be treated with uh, DRC. He did get the plasmapheresis, and then he uh, went on DRC, and he had about five-year remission during which his neuropathy uh, ended up improving, and uh, actually he's been doing quite well since that time. So he was a DRC um, you know, uh, candidate. I probably would have um, had the same dilemma now, you know, knowing that ibrutinib is an option, and certainly would have considered that you know, in a patient like this. And you know, we, we heard that he was um, 64, I believe was his age, 60, 68, a little bit young, I mean, a little bit older, but still, 68 is very young today. So, um, you know, we do want to keep in mind um, the relative risks. Although, Stathis, relative risk of DRC, pretty minimal, right? The long term risk of myelodysplasia. Yeah. So, the, the, the study that uh, Dr. Uh, Castrides and Dr. Demopoulos, even with the update that you've provided, show us that there is really, um, you know, good long term tolerance to this uh, regimen. Okay, I am glad you all had an opportunity to participate in uh, this clinic. And uh, I am told now that we can actually have a break and uh, we can get some coffee outside. And maybe um, if it's uh, possible to get everybody back in here in about 15 minutes time, we're gonna go on to the last session of the day. And I think this will be a very exciting one because this deals with where we're leaving off here. You know, complications, long-term complications of therapy and concern over secondary malignancies and also talking about maybe some of the screening that we ought to do because of other malignancies that we see in Waldenstrom's patients. So plan on coming back. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you back in 15 minutes time. Thank you.